I Where are we in this book? Page 110, middle of page 110, which is called Expression and Dissonance. <clears throat> Five better late than never. All right. We're so going to page one twenty five. Oh, there's a quote. Isn't that nice? Nice block quote. The rebellion against semblance, art's dissatisfaction with the self, has been an intermittent element of its claim to truth from time immemorial. Art, whatever its material, has always desired dissonance, a desire suppressed by the affirmative power of society with which aesthetic semblance has been bound up. Dissonance is effectively expression the consonant and harmonious want to soften and eliminate it. Expression and semblance are fundamentally antithetical. If expression is scarcely to be conceived except as the expression of suffering, joy has proven inimical to expression, perhaps because it has yet to exist and bliss would be beyond expression. Expression is the element imminent to art through which, as one of its constituents, Art defends itself against the imminence that it develops by its law of form. What a sentence. Artistic expression comports itself mimetically, just as the expression of living creatures is that of pain. The lineaments of expression inscribed in artworks, if they are not to be mute, are demarcation lines against semblance. Yet, in that artworks as such remain semblance, the conflict between semblance, form in the broadest sense, and expression remains unresolved and fluctuates historically. Mimetic comportment, an attitude toward reality distinct from the fixed antithesis of subject and object, is seized in art, the organ of mimesis since the mimetic taboo, by semblance and, as the complement to the autonomy of form, becomes its bearer. The unfolding of art is that of a quid pro quo. Expression, through which non-aesthetic experience reaches most deeply into the work, becomes the archetype of everything fictive in art, as if at the juncture where art is most permeable to real expression, culture most rigorously stood guard that the border not be violated. The expressive values of artwork cease to be immediately those of something alive. Refracted and transformed, they become the expression of the work itself. The term musica ficta is the earliest evidence of this. That quid pro quo not only neutralizes mimesis, it also derives from it. If, mim if mimetic comportment does not imitate something but rather makes itself like itself, this is precisely what artworks take it upon themselves to fulfill. In their expression, artworks do not imitate the impulses of individuals, nor in any way those of their authors. In cases where this is their essential determination, they fall as copies precisely to the mercy of that reification that the mimetic impulse opposes. At the same time, artistic expression enforces on itself history's judgment that mimesis is an archaic comportment.
that as an immediate practice, mimesis is not knowledge, that what makes itself like itself does not become truly alike, that mimetic intervention has failed. Thus mimesis is banished to art that comports itself mimetically, just as art absorbs the critique of mimesis into itself by carrying out the objectivation of this impulse. Although there has rarely been doubt that expression is an essential element of art, even the present hesitancy toward expression confirms its relevance and actually holds for art as a whole. Its concept, like most key aesthetic concepts, is recalcitrant to the theory that wants to name it. What is qualitatively contrary to the concept per se can only with difficulty be brought within the bounds of its concept. The form in which something may be thought is not indifferent to what is thought. From the perspective of the philosophy of history, expression in art must be interpreted as a compromise. Expression approaches the transsubjective. It is the form of knowledge that, having preceded the polarity of subject and art, does not recognize this polarity as definitive. <clears throat> Art is secular, however, in that it attempts to achieve such knowledge within the bounds of the polarity of subject and object as an act of autonomous spirit. Aesthetic expression is the objectification of the non-objective, and in fact, in such a fashion that through its objectification, objectification it becomes a second-order non-objectivity. It becomes what speaks out of the artifact, not as an imitation of the subject. Yet precisely the objectivation of expression, which coincides with art, requires the subject who makes it and, in bourgeois terms, makes use of his own mimetic impulses. Art is expressive when what is objective, subjectively mediated, speaks, whether this be sadness, energy, or longing. Expression is the suffering countenance of artworks. They turn this countenance only toward those who return its gaze, even when they are composed in happy tones or glorify the V opportune of Rococo. Expression were merely the doubling of the subjectively felt, it would be null and void. The artist who condemns a work as being an impression rather than an invention knows this perfectly well. Rather than such feelings, the model of expression is that of Extra artistic things and situations. Sorry. Yes, hello. Come in, please. Historical processes and functions are already sedimented in them and speak out of them. Kafka is exemplary for the gesture of art when he carries out the retransformation of expression back into the actual occurrences enciphered in that expression. And from that, he derives his irresistibility. <coughs> Yet expression here becomes doubly puzzling because the sedimented, the expressed meaning is once more meaningless. It is natural history that leads to nothing but what, impotently enough, it is able to express. Art is imitation exclusively as the imitation of an objective expression, remote from psychology, of which the sensorium was perhaps once conscious in the world and which now subsists only in artworks. Through expression, art closes itself off to being for another, which always threatens to engulf it and becomes eloquent in itself. This is art's mimetic consummation. Its expression is the antithesis of expressing something. Such mimesis is the ideal of art, not its practical procedure, nor is it an attitude directed toward expressive values. The contribution made to expression by the artist is the power of mimicry, which in him releases the expressed. If what is expressed becomes the tangible content of the artist's soul and the artwork a copy of this content, the work degenerates into a blurred photograph. Schubert's resignation has its locus not in the purported mood of his music, nor in how he was feeling, as if the music could give a clue to this, but in the it is thus that it announces with the gesture of letting oneself fall. This is its expression. Its quintessence is art's character of eloquence, 
fundamentally distinct from language as its medium. It is worth speculating whether the former is incompatible with the latter. That would in part explain the efforts of prose since Joyce to put discursive language out of action, or at least to subordinate it to formal categories to the point that construction becomes unrecognizable. The new art tries to bring about the transformation of communicative into mimetic language. By virtue of its double character, language is a constituent of art and its mortal enemy. Etruscan vases in the Villa Giulia are eloquent in the highest degree and incommensurable with all communicative language. The true language of art is mute, and its muteness takes priority over poetry's significative element, which in music too is not altogether lacking. That aspect of the Etruscan vases that most resembles speech depends most likely on their here I am or this is what I am, a selfhood, a selfhood not first excised by identificatory thought from the interdependence of entities. Thus the rhinoceros, that mute animal, seems to say, I am a rhinoceros. Wilke's line, for there is no place without eyes to see you. <coughs> which Benjamin held in high esteem, codified the non-significative language of artworks in an incomparable fashion. Expression is the gaze of artworks. Compared to significative language, the language of expression is older, though unfulfilled, as if artworks, by molding themselves to the subject through their organization, recapitulated the way the subject originated, how it rested itself free. Artworks bear expression not where they communicate the subject, but rather where they reverberate with the proto-history of subjectivity, of insolment, for which tremolo of any sort is a miserable surrogate. This is the affinity of the artwork to the subject, and it endures because this proto-history survives in the subject and recommences in every moment of history. Only the subject is an, in, is an adequate instrument of expression, however much, though it imagines itself unmediated. It is itself mediated. However much the expressed resembles the subject, however much the impulses are those of the subject, they are at the same time apersonal, participating in the integrative power of the ego without ever becoming identical with it. The expression of artworks is the non-subjective in the subject, not so much that subject's expression as its copy. There's nothing so expressive as the eyes of animals, especially apes, which seem objectively to mourn that they are not human. By the transposition of impulses into artworks, which make them their own by virtue of their integration, these impulses remain the plenipotentiary in the aesthetic continuum of extra aesthetic nature, yet are no longer incarnate as its after image. This ambivalence is registered by every genuine aesthetic experience, and incomparably so in Kant's description of the feeling of the sublime as a trembling between nature and freedom. Such modification of mimesis is, without any reflection on the spiritual, the constitutive act of spiritualism in all art. Later art only develops this act, but it is already posited in the modification of mimesis through the work provided that it does not occur through mimesis itself as, so to speak, the physiologically primordial form of spirit. The modification shares the guilt of the affirmative character of art because it mollifies the pain through imagination, just as the spiritual totality in which this pain disappears makes it controllable and leaves it untransformed. However much art is marked and potentiated by universal alienation, it is least alienated insofar as everything in it passes through spirit, is humanized without force. Art oscillates between ideology and what Hegel confirmed as the native domain of spirit, the truth of spirit's self-certainty. No matter how much spirit may exert domination in art, its objectivation frees it from the aims of domination. And that aesthetic structures create a continuum that is totally spirit. They become the semblance of a blocked being in itself and whose reality the intentions of the subject would be fulfilled and extinguished. 
Art corrects conceptual knowledge because, in complete isolation, it carries out what conceptual knowledge in vain awaits from the non-pictorial subject-object relation, that through a subjective act, what is objective would be unveiled. <clears throat> Art does not postpone this act ad infinitum, but demands it of its own finitude at the price of its illusoriness. Through spiritualization, the radical domination of nature, its own, Art corrects the domination of nature as the domination of another. What establishes itself in the artwork as an alien and rudimentary fetish that endures in opposition to the subject is the plenipotentiary of the non-alienated. By contrast, however, what comports itself in the world as though it were unidentical nature is reduced all the more surely to the matter, to the material of the domination of nature, to a vehicle of social domination and is thus truly alienated. Expression, by which nature seeps most deeply into art, is at the same time what it is not literally, what is not literally nature, a memento of what expression itself is not, of what could not have become concrete except through the how of that expression. <clears throat> The mediation of expression in artworks through their spiritualization, which in Expressionism's early period was evident to its most important exponents, implies the critique of that clumsy dualism of form and expression that orients traditional aesthetics as well as the consciousness of many genuine artists. Not that this dichotomy is without any basis. The preponderance of expression at one point and the formal aspect at another cannot be denied especially in older art, which offered impulses a framework. Since then, both elements have become inextricably mediated by each other. Where works are not fully integrated, not fully formed, they sacrifice precisely the expressivity for the sake of which they dispense with the labor and effort of form, and the supposedly pure form that disavows expression rattles mechanically. Expression is a phenomenon of interference, a function of technical procedures no less than it is mimetic. Mimesis is itself summed up by the density of the technical procedure, whose imminent rationality indeed seems to work in opposition to expression. The compulsion exerted by integral works is equivalent to their eloquence, to what speaks in them, and no merely suggestive effect. Suggestion is, furthermore, itself related to mimetic pr processes. This leads to a subjective paradox of art to produce what is blind expression by way of reflection, that is, through form, not to rationalize the blind, but to produce it aesthetically, to make things of which we do not know what they are. This situation, which has today been sharpened to an antithesis, has a long prehistory. In speaking of the precipitate, precip, precipitate of the absurd, the incommensurable in every artwork, Goethe not only formulated the modern constellation of the conscious and unconscious, but also envisioned the prospect that the sphere of art, sheltered from consciousness as a preserve of the unconscious, would become that spleen as which art understood itself to be in the second romanticism since Baudelaire. <clears throat> a virtually self-transcending preserve built into rationality. Pointing this out, however, does not dispatch art. Whoever argues against modernism in this fashion holds mechanically to the dualism of form and expression. What theorists take for a strictly logical contradiction is familiar to artists and unfolds in their work as that control over the mimetic element that summons up, destroys, and redeems its spontaneity. Spontaneity amid the involuntary is the vital element of art, and this ability is a dependable criterion of artistic capacity, though it does not gloss over the fatality of this capacity. <clears throat> Artists are familiar with this capacity as their sense of form. It provides the mediating category to the Kantian problematic of how art, which Kant considered blatantly non-conceptual, subjectively bears that element of the universal and the necessary that, according to the critique of reason, is reserved exclusively for discursive knowledge. The sense of form is the reflection, at once blind and binding, 
of the work in itself on which that reflection must depend. It is an objectivity closed to itself that devolves upon the subjective mimetic capacity, which for its part gains its force through its antithesis, rational construction. The blindness of the sense of form corresponds to the necessity in the object. The irrationality of the expressive element is for art the aim of all aesthetic rationality. Its task is to divert itself in opposition to all imposed order, both of hopeless natural necessity and chaotic contingency. Aesthetic necessity becomes aware of its fictive element through the experience of contingency. But art does not seek to do justice to contingency by its intentional fictual, fictive incorporation in order thus to depotentiate its subjective mediations. Rather, art does justice to the contingent by probing in the darkness of the trajectory of its own necessity. The more truly art follows this trajectory, the less self-transparent art is. It makes itself dark. Its imminent process has the quality of following a divining rod. To follow where the hand is drawn, this is mimesis as the film fulfillment of objectivity. Examples of automatic writing, including the Schoenberg who wrote Er Erwartung, were inspired by this utopia, only to be compelled to discover that the tension between expression and objectivation does not issue in their identity. There is no middle position between the self-censorship of the need for expression and the concessiveness of construction. Objectivation traverses the extremes. When untamed by taste or artistic understanding, the need for expression converges with the bluntness of rational objectivity. On the other hand, art's thinking of itself, its noesis noesos, noesios, is not to be restrained by any preordained irrationality. Aesthetic rationality must plunge blindfolded into the making of the work rather than directing it externally as an act of reflection over the artwork. Artworks are smart or foolish according to their procedures, not according to the thoughts their author has about them. Such imminent understanding of the material assures that Beckett's work is at every point sealed tightly against superficial rationality. This is by no means the exclusive prerogative of modern art, but equally evident in the abbreviations in late Beethoven, in the renunciation of superfluous and to this extent irrational ornamentation. Conversely, lesser artworks, facile in music especially, are marked by an imminent stupidity to which modernism's ideal of maturity was a polemical reaction. The aporia of mimesis and construction compels artworks to unite radicalism with deliberation, without the aid of any apocryphal, trumped-up hypotheses. Deliberation, however, does not resolve the aporia. Historically, one of the roots of the rebellion against semblance is the allergy to expression. Here, if anywhere in art, the relation between the generations plays a part. Expressionism became the father image. Empirically, it has been confirmed that inhibited, conventional, and aggressive reactionary individuals tend to reject interception, self-awareness, in any form, and along with it, expression as such, as being all too human. They are the ones who, in the context of general estrangement from art, declare themselves with particular resentment against modernism. Psychologically, they obey defense mechanisms with which a weakly developed ego repudiates whatever disturbs its restricted functional capacity and may, above all, damage its narcissism. This psychological posture is that of an intolerance to ambiguity, an impatience with which is ambivalent and not strictly definable. Ultimately, it is the refusal of what is open, of what has not been predetermined by any jurisdiction, ultimately of experience itself. Immediately back of the mimetic taboo stands a sexual one. Nothing should be moist. Art becomes hygienic. Many artistic directions identify with this taboo and with the witch hunt against expression. The anti-psychologism of modernism has shifted its function. Once a prerogative of the avant-garde, which rebelled against Jungenstil, as well as against the realism protracted by a turn toward inwardness, this anti-psychologism was meanwhile socialized and made serviceable to the status quo. The category of inwardness, according to Max Weber's thesis, is to be dated back to Protestantism, which subordinated works to faith. 
<clears throat> Although inwardness, even in Kant, implied a protest against a social order heteronymously imposed on its subject subjects, it was from the beginning marked by an indifference toward this order, a readiness to leave things as they are and to obey. This accorded with the origin of inwardness in the labor process. Inwardness served to cultivate an anthropological type that would dutifully, quasi-voluntarily, perform the wage labor required by the new mode of production necessitated by the relations of production. With the growing powerlessness of the autonomous subject, inwardness consequently became completely ideological, the mirage of an inner kingdom where the silent majority are indemnified for what is denied them socially. Inwardness thus becomes increasingly shadowy and empty, indeed contentless in itself. Arch no longer wants to accommodate itself to this situation, yet art is scarcely imaginable without the element of inwardness. Benjamin once said that, in his opinion, inwardness could go fly a kite. This was directed against Kierkegaard and the philosophy of inwardness that claimed him as their founder, even though that term would have been as antipathetic to the theologian as the word ontology. Benjamin had in mind abstract subjectivity that powerlessly sets itself up as substance. But his comment is no more the whole truth than abstract subjectivity is. Spirit, certainly Benjamin's own, must enter itself if it is to be able to negate what is opaque. This could be demonstrated by the antithesis of Beethoven and jazz, a contrast to which many musicians' ears are already beginning to be deaf. Beethoven is, in modified yet determinable fashion, the full experience of external life returning inwardly, just as time, the medium of music, is the inward sense. Popular music, in all of its many varieties, does not undergo this sublimation and is, as such, a somatic stimulant and therefore regressive vis-a-vis -vis aesthetic autonomy. Even inwardness participates in dialectics, though not as Kierkegaard thought. The result of the liquidation of inwardness was by no means the surfacing of a type of person cured of ideology, but rather one who never became an individual in the first place, the type David Reisman termed outer directed. This casts a reconciling light on the category of inwardness in art. In fact, the rapid denunciation of radically expressive works as being examples of hyperbolic late romanticism has become the predictable babble of all those who favor a return to the pristine. Aesthetic self-relinquishment in the artwork requires not a weak or conformist ego, but a forceful one. Only a, the autonomous self is able to turn critically against itself and break through its illusory imprisonment. This is not conceivable as long as the mimetic element is repressed by a rigid aesthetic superego, rather than that the mimetic element disappears into and is maintained in the objectivation of the tension between itself and its antithesis. <clears throat> All the same, semblance is most strikingly obvious in expression because it makes its appearance as if it were illusionless even while subsuming itself to aesthetic semblance. Major criticism of expression has been sparked by its perception as theatrics. In the fully administered world, the mimetic taboo, a keystone of bourgeois ontology, encroached on the zone that had been tolerantly reserved for mimesis, whereby it beneficially revealed human immediacy to be alive. Beyond this, however, the allergy to expression supports that hatred of the subject without which no critique of the commodity world would even be meaningful. The subject is abstractly negated. Indeed, the subject, which in compensation inflates itself, the more powerless and functional it becomes, is false consciousness the moment it lays claim to expression by feigning a relevance that was withdrawn from it. Yet the emancipation of society from the supremacy of its relations of production has as its aim what those relations have to date impeded, the real establishment of the subject. An expression is not simply the hubris of the subject, but the lament of its miscarriage as a cipher of its possibility. Certainly, the allergy to expression may be most profoundly legitimated by the fact that something in expression tends towards mendacity, regardless of any aesthetic manipulation. 
expression is a priori imitation. Latently implicit in expression is the trust that by being spoken or screamed, all will be made better. This is a rudiment of magic, faith in what Freud polemically called the omnipotence of thought. Yet expression is not altogether circumscribed by the magic spell. That it is spoken, that distance is thus won from the trapped immediacy of suffering, transforms suffering just as screaming diminishes unbearable pain. Expression that has been objectivated as language endures. What has once been said never fades away completely. Neither the evil nor the good, neither the slogan of the final solution nor the hope of reconciliation. What accedes to language enters the movement of a humanness that does not yet exist, is compelled toward language and alive only by virtue of its helplessness. Stumbling along behind his reification, the subject limits that reification by means of the mimetic vestige, the plenipotentiary of an undamaged life in the midst of mutilated life which subverts the subject to ideology. The inex inextricability of reification and mimesis defines the aporia of artistic expression. There is no general test for deciding if an artist who wipes out expression altogether has become the mouthpiece of reified consciousness or of the speechless, expressionless expression that denounces it. Authentic, authentic art knows the expression of the expressionless, a kind of weeping without tears. By contrast, Neue Sacrikeit's polished extirpation of expression contributes to universal conformism and subordinates anti-functional art to a principle that originates entirely in functionality. This form of reaction fails to recognize in expression what is not metaphorical, not ornamental. The more unreservedly artworks open them themselves to this, the more they become depositions of expression and effectively invert sacrikite. At the very least, it is evident that anti-expressive and, like Mongeon's, affirmatively mathematized artworks have by no means passed final judgment on expression. If the subject is no longer able to speak directly, then at least it should, in accord with a modernism that has not pledged itself to absolute construction, speak through things, through their alienated and mutilated form. <clears throat> the task of aesthetics is not to comprehend artworks as her hermeneutical objects. In the contemporary situation, it is their incomprehensibility that needs to be comprehended. What is so resistlessly absorbed as a cliché by the watchword? the absurd, could only be recuperated by a theory that thinks its truth. It cannot simply be divided off from the spiritualization of artworks as counterpoint to that spiritualization. This counterpart is, in Hegel's words, the ether of artworks. It is spirit itself in its omnipresence and not the intention of the enigma. <clears throat> The task of aesthetics is not to comprehend artworks as hermeneutical objects. In the contemporary situation, is, is their incomprehensibility that needs to be comprehended. What is so resistlessly absorbed as a cliché by the watchword, the absurd, could only be recuperated by a theory that thinks it's truth. It cannot simply be divided off from the spiritualization of artworks as counterpoint to that spiritualization. This counterpoint is, in Hegel's word, the ether of artworks. It is spirit itself in its omnipresence and not the intention of the enigma. For in that it negates the spirit that dominates nature. The spirit of artworks does not appear as spirit. It ignites on what is opposed to it, on materiality. In no way is spirit most present in the most spiritual artworks. Art is, re art is redemptive in the act by which the spirit in it throws itself away. Art holds true to the shudder, but not by regression to it. Rather, art is its legacy. The spirit of artworks produces the shudder by externalizing it in objects. Thus, art participates in the actual movement of history in accord with the law of enlightenment. By virtue of the self-reflection of genius, what once seemed to be reality emigrates into imagination, where it survives by becoming conscious of its own unreality. The historical trajectory of art as spiritualization is that of the critique of myth as well as that toward its redemption. 
the imagination confirms the possibility of what it recollects. This double movement of spirit and art describes its proto-history, which is inscribed in its concepts rather than its empirical history. This uncheckable movement of spirit toward what has eluded it becomes in art the voice that speaks for what was lost in the most distantly archaic. Mimesis in art is the pre-spiritual, is contrary to spirit and yet also that on which spirit ignites. In artworks, spirit has become their principle of construction, although it fulfills its telos only when it emerges from what it is to be constructed, from the mimetic impulses, by shaping itself to them rather than allowing itself to be imposed on them by sovereign rule. Form objectivates the particular impulses only when it follows them where they want to go of their own accord. This alone is the mythesis of artworks in reconciliation. The rationality of artworks becomes spirit only when it is immersed in its polar opposite, the divergence of the constructive and the mimetic, which no artwork can resolve and which is virtually the original sin of aesthetic spirit, has its correlative in that element of the ridiculous and clownish that even the most significant works bear, and that unconcealed is inextricable from their significance. The inadequacy of classicism of any persuasion originates in its repression of this element, a repression that art must mistrust. The progressive spiritualization of art in the name of maturity only accentuates the ridiculous all the more glaringly. The more the artwork's own organization assimilates itself to a logical order by virtue of its inner exactitude, the more obviously the difference between the artwork's logicity and the logicity that governs empirically becomes the parody of the latter. The more reasonable the work becomes in terms of its formal constitution, the more ridiculous it becomes according to the standard of, of empirical reason. Its ridiculousness is, however, also part of a condemnation of empirical rationality. It accuses the rationality of social praxis of having become an end in itself and as such the irrational and mad reversal of means into ends. The ridiculous in art, which Philistines recognize better than do those who are naively at home in art, and the folly of a rationality made absolute indict one another reciprocally. Incidentally, when viewed from the perspective of the praxis of self-preservation, happiness, sex, is equally ridiculous as can be spitefully pointed out by anyone who is not driven by it. Ridiculousness is the residue of the mimetic in art, the price of its self-enclosure. In his condemnation of this element, the Philistine always has an ignominious measure of justification. The ridiculous, as a barbaric residuum of something alien to form, misfires in art if art fails to reflect and shape it. If it remains on the level of the childish and is taken for such, it emerges with the calculated fun of the culture industry. By its very concepts, art implies kitsch, just as the obligation it imposes of sublimating the ridiculous it presupposes educational privilege and class structure. Fun is art's punishment for this. All the same, the ridiculous elements in artworks are most akin to their intentionless levels and therefore, in great works, also closest to their secret. Foolish subjects like those of the magic flute and der Fleischlutz have more truth content through the medium of the music than does the ring, which gravely aims at the ultimate. In its clownishness, art consolingly recollects prehistory in the primordial world of animals. Apes in the zoo together perform what resemble clown routines. The collusion of children with clowns is a collusion with art, which adults drive out of them just as they drive out their collusion with animals. Human beings have not succeeded in so thoroughly repressing their likeness to animals that they are unable in an instant to recapture it and be flooded with joy. The language of little children and animals seems to be the same. In the similarity of clowns to animals, the likeness of, anim of humans to apes flashes up. The constellation animal, fool, clown is a fundamental layer of art. This is an important page. 
As a thing that negates the world of things, every artwork is a priori helpless when it is called on to legitimate itself to this world. So I just want to make a note. Because he, he's talking about how, uh, like, art styles that uh, kind of like arbitrary arts, this is what I think he's saying up above, is how art styles that kind of like arbitrarily, uh, like, follow a classical style and <clears throat> use those kind of like classical tech, uh, motifs, like classicism, are ridiculous because you can see that they're just following this kind of like arbitrarily chosen logical order that does not then like their their works are like formally consistent with this logicity but it does not like follow some uh, you know greater like aesthetic uh, rule but uh, that seems to be like relevant to social realism which is like very fixated on classicism Anyway, I'm going to continue. As a thing that negates the world of things, every artwork is a priori helpless when it is called on to legitimate itself to this world. Still, art cannot simply refuse the demand for legitimation by pointing to this a priority. It is hard to be astonished for art's enigmaticalness if it is taken neither as a source of pleasure, as it is for those alien to art, nor as an exceptional realm, as it is for the connoisseur, but as a substance of personal experience. Yet this substance demands that the elements of art not be abandoned, but secured when art is fundamentally challenged by its experience. An inkling of this is had when artworks are experienced in so-called cultural contexts that are alien or incommensurable to them. In these situations, artworks are displayed naked to the test of their qui bono, a test from which they are protected only by the leaky roof of their own familiar context. In such situations, the disrespectful question, which ignores that the taboo is surrounding the aesthetic zone, often becomes faithful to the quality of a work. Observed completely externally, the artwork's dubiousness is uncovered as relentlessly as when they are observed completely internally. <coughs> the enigmaticalness of artworks remains bound up with history. It was through history that they became an enigma. It is history that ever and again makes them such, and conversely, it is history alone, which gave them their authority, that holds at a distance the embarrassing question of their raison d'etre. The enigma enigmaticalness of artworks is less their irrationality than their rationality. The more methodically they are ruled, more sharply their enigmaticalness is thrown into relief. Through form, artworks gain their resemblance to language, seeming at every point to say just this and only this, and at the same time, whatever it is slips away. All artworks, and art altogether, are enigmas. Since antiquity, this has been an irritation to the theory of art. That artworks say something and in the same breath conceal it expresses their enigmaticalness from the perspective of language. This characteristic cavorts clownishly. If one is within the artwork, if one participates in its imminent completion, this enigmaticalness makes itself invisible. If one steps outside the work, breaking the contract with its imminent con context, this enigmaticalness returns like a spirit. This gives further reason for the study of those who are alien to art, and their proximity, the enigmaticalness of art, becomes outrageous to the point that art is completely negated. Unwittingly, the ultimate criticism of art, and in, it, in that it is a defective attitude, a confirmation of art's truth. It is impossible to explain art to those who have no feeling for it. They are not able to bring an intellectual understanding of it into their living experience. For them, the reality principle is such an obsession that it places a taboo on aesthetic comportment as a whole. 
incited by the cultural approbation of art, alienness to art often changes into aggression, not the least of the causes of the contemporary de-aestheticization of art. As enigmaticalness may in an elementary fashion confirm the so-called unmusical, who does not understand the language of music, hears nothing but nonsense, and wonders what all the noise is about. The difference between what this person hears and what the initiated hears defines art's enigmaticalness. This is, of course, not restricted to music, whose aconceptuality makes it almost too obvious. Whoever refuses to reenact the work under the discipline it imposes falls into the empty gaze cast by a painting or a poem, the same empty gaze that, in a sense, the art alien encounter in music, and it is precisely the empty questioning gaze that the experience and interpretation of artworks must assimilate if they are not to go astray. Failing to perceive the abyss is no protection from it. However, consciousness seeks to safeguard itself from losing its way is fateful. There's no answer that would convince someone who would ask such questions as, why imitate something? Or why tell a story as if it were true when obviously the facts are otherwise and it just distorts reality? Artworks fall helplessly mute before the question, what's it for? And before the reproach that they are actually pointless. If, for instance, one responded that fictive narration can touch more deeply on the essence of historical reality than can factual reportage, a possible reply would be that precisely this is a matter of theory, and that theory has no need of fiction. This manifestation of the enigmaticalness of art is as incomprehension in the face of questions of putatively grand principle is familiar in the broader context of the bluff inherent and the question as to the meaning of life. The awkwardness prompted <clears throat> by such questions can easily be confused with, with their irrefutability. The level of the abstraction is so remote from what is effortlessly subsumed that the actual question vanishes. Understanding art's enigmaticalness is not equivalent to understanding specific artworks, which requires an objective experiential reenactment from within in the same sense in which the interpretation of a musical work means its faithful performance. Understanding is itself a problematic category in the face of art's enigmaticalness. Whoever seeks to understand artworks exclusively through the imminence of consciousness within them, by this very measure, fails to understand them, and as such, understanding grows. So does the feeling of its insufficiency caught blindly in the spell of art, to which art's own truth content is opposed. If one who exits from this imminent context or was never in it registers the enigmaticalness with animosity, the enigmaticalness disappears deceptively into the artistic experience. The better an artwork is understood, the more it is unpuzzled on one level and the more obscure its constitutive enigmaticalness becomes. It only emerges demonstratively in the profoundest experience of art. If a work opens itself completely, it reveals itself as a question and demands reflection, that the work vanishes into the distance only to return to those who thought they understood it, overwhelming them for a second time with the question, what is it? Art's enigmaticalness can, however, be recognized as a constitutive where it is absent. Artworks that unfold its to contemplation and thought without any remainder are not artworks. Enigma here is not a glib synonym for problem, a concept that is only aesthetically significant in the strict sense of a task posed by the imminent composition of works. In no less strict terms, artworks are enigmas. They contain the potential for the solution. The solution is not objectively given. Every artwork is a picture puzzle, a puzzle to be solved, but this puzzle is constituted in such a fashion that it remains a vexation, the pre-established roading of its, desire, of its observer. The newspaper picture puzzle recapitulates playfully what artworks carry out in earnest. Specifically, artworks are like picture puzzles in that what they hide, like Poe's letter, is visible and is, by being visible, hidden. The German language, in its proto-philosophical description of aesthetic experience, rightly expresses the, that one understands something of art, not that one understands art. 
Connoisseurship of art is the combination of an adequate comprehension of the material and a narrow-minded incomprehension of the enigma. It is neutral to what is cloaked. Those who peruse art solely with comprehension make it into something straightforward, which is furthest from what it is. If one seeks to get a closer look at a rainbow, it disappears. Of all the arts, music is the prototypical example of this. It is at once completely enigmatic and totally evident. It cannot be solved, only its form can be deciphered, and precisely this is requisite for the philosophy of art. He alone would understand music who hears with all the alienness of the unmusical and with all of Siegfried's familiarity with the language of the birds. Understanding, however, does not extinguish the enigmaticalness of art. Even the felicitously interpreted work asks for further understanding, as if waiting for the redemptive word that would dissolve its constitutive darkening. Following artworks through in the imagination is the most complete, most deceptive surrogate for understanding, though obviously also a step toward it. Those who can adequately imagine music without hearing it possess that connection with it required for its understanding. Understanding in the highest sense, a solution of the enigma that at the same time maintains the enigma, depends on a spiritualization of art and artistic experience whose primary medium is the imagination. The spiritualization of art approaches its enigmaticalness not directly through conceptual elucidation, but rather by concretizing its enigmaticalness. The solution of the enigmas amounts to giving the reason for its insolubility, which is the gaze artworks direct at the viewer. The demand of artworks that they be understood, that they, their content be grasped, is bound to their specific experience, but it can only be fulfilled by way of the theory that reflects this experience. What the enigmaticalness of artworks refers to can only be thought mediatedly. The objection to the phenomenology of art as to any phenomenology that imagines it can lay its hands directly on the essence, is not that it is anti-empirical, but, on the contrary, that it brings thinking experience to a halt. The much derided incomprehensibility of hermetic artworks amounts to the admission of the enigmaticalness of all art. Part of the rage against hermetic works is that they also shatter the comprehensibility of traditional works. It holds true in general that the works sanctioned by tradition and public opinion as being well understood withdraw behind their galvanized surface and become completely incomprehensible. Those manifestly incomprehensible works that emphasize their enigmaticalness are potentially the most comprehensible. Art in the most emphatic sense lacks the concept even when it employs concepts and adapts its facade to comprehension. No concept that enters an artwork remains what it is. Each and every concept is so transformed that its scope can be affected and its meaning refashioned. In Thraco's poems, the word sonata acquires a unique importance by its sound and by the associations established by the poem. If one wanted to envision a particular sonata on the basis of the diffuse sounds that are suggested, the sense of the word in the poem could be missed just as the conjunct image would be incongruous with such a sonata in the sonata form itself. At the same time, this would be legitimate because the word coalesces out of fragments and scraps of sonatas, and its very name is reminiscent of the sound that is meant and awakened in the work. The term sonata describes works that are highly articulated, motivically and thematically wrought, and internally dynamic. Their unity is a clearly differentiated manifold with development and reprise. The verse there are rooms filled with chords and sonatas, retains little of this, but has, rather, the feeling of the childish naming of names. It has more to do with the spurious title Moonlight Sonata than with the composition itself, and yet is no coincidence. Without the sonatas that his sister played, there would not have been the isolated sounds in which the melancholy of the poet sought shelter. Something of this marks even the poem's simplest words, which are drawn from a communicative language. That is why Brecht's critique of autonomous art, that it simply reiterates what something is, misses the mark. Even Chekhov's omnipresent is is alienated in the artwork from its conceptual sense. It expresses no existential judgment, but rather its pale after image qualitatively transformed to the point of negation. The assertion that something is amounts to both more and less and includes the implication that something is not. 
when Brecht or William Carlos Williams sabotages the poetic and approximates an empirical report, the actual result is by no means such a report, but the polemical rejection of the exalted lyrical tone, the empirical sentences translated into the aesthetic monad acquire an altogether different quality. The anti-lyrical tone and the estrangement of the, the appropriated facts are two sides of the same coin. Judgment itself undergoes metamorphosis in the artwork. Artworks are a synthesis analogous to judgment. In artworks, however, synthesis does not result in judgment. Of no artwork is it possible to, to, to determine its judgment or what its so-called message is. It's therefore questionable whether artworks can possibly be engagé, even when they emphasize their engagement. What works amount to that in which they are unified cannot be formulated as a judgment, not even as one that they state in words and sentences. Moriki has a little poem entitled Mousetrap Rhyme. If one restricted interpretation to its discursive content, the poem would amount to no more than sadistic identification with what civilized custom has done to an animal disdained as a parasite. <clears throat> mousetrap Rhyme. The child circles the mousetrap three times in chance. Little guest, little house, dearest tiny or grown-up mouse, boldly pay us a visit tonight when the moon shines bright. But close the door, back of you tight, you hear? And be careful for your little tail. After dinner we will sing, after dinner we will spring, and make a little dance. Swish, swish, my old cat will probably be dancing with. The child's taunt, my old cat will probably be dancing with, if it really is a taunt and not the involuntarily friendly image of child, cat, and mouse dancing, the two animals on their hind legs, once appropriated by the poem, no longer has the last word. To reduce the poem to a taunt is to ignore its social content, along with its poetic content. The poem is the non-judgmental reflex of language on a miserable, socially conditioned ritual, and as such, it transcends it by subordinating itself to it. The poem's gesture, which points to this ritual as if nothing else were possible, holds court over the gapless imminence of the ritual by turning the force of self-evidence into an indictment of that ritual. Art judges exclusively by abstaining from judgment. This is the defense of naturalism. Form, which shapes verse into the echo of a mythical epigram, negates its faithful, faithfulness. Echo reconciles. These processes transpiring in the interior of artworks make them truly infinite in themselves. It is not that artworks differ from significative language by the absence of meanings. Rather, these meanings, through their absorption, become a matter of accident. The movements by which this absorption of meaning occurs are concretely prescribed in, by every aesthetically formed object. Artworks share with enigmas the duality of being determinate and indeterminate. They are question marks, not univocal even through synthesis. Nevertheless, their figure is so precise that it determines the point where the work breaks off. As in enigmas, the answer is both hidden and demanded by the structure. This is the function of the work's imminent logic, of the lawfulness that transpires in it, and that is the theodicy of the concept of purpose in art. The aim of artworks is the determination of the indeterminate. Works are purposeful in themselves without having any positive purpose beyond their own arrangement. Their purposefulness, however, is legitimated as the figure of the answer to the enigma. Through organization, artworks become more than they are. In recent aesthetic debates, especially in the fine arts, the concept of écriture has become relevant, inspired probably by Cleese drawings, which approximate scrawled writing. Like a searchlight, this category of modern art illuminates the past of the, the art of the past. All artworks are writing, not just those that are obviously such, they are hieroglyphs for which the code has been lost, a loss that plays into their content. Artworks are language only as writing. If no artwork is ever a judgment, each artwork contains elements derived from judgment and bears an aspect of being correct and incorrect, true and false. Yet the silent and determinate answer of artworks does not reveal itself to interpretation with a single stroke, as a new immediacy, but only by way of all mediations, those of the work's discipline as well as those of thought and philosophy. 
the enigmaticalness outlives the interpretation that arrives at the answer. If the enigmaticalness of artworks is not localized in what is experienced in them, in aesthetic understanding, if the enigmaticalness only bursts up open in the distance, the experience that immerses itself in the artworks and is rewarded with corroboration itself becomes enigmatic. The enigma that what is multivocally entwined can be univocally and compellingly understood as such. For the experience of artworks, whatever its starting point is as Kant described him, himself described it, necessarily imminent and transparent right into its most sublime nuance. The musician who understands the score follows its most minute impulses, and yet in a certain sense he does not know what he plays. The situation is no different for the actor, and precisely in this is the mimetic capacity made manifest most drastically in the praxis of artistic performance as the imitation of the dynamic curves of what is performed. It is the quintessence of understanding this side of the enigma. However, as soon as the experience of artworks flags, of artworks flags, they present their enigma as a grimace. Incessantly, the experience of artworks is threatened by the enigmaticalness. If enigmaticalness disappears completely from the experience, if experience supposes that it has become completely imminent to the object, the enigma's gaze suddenly appears again. Thus is preserved the artwork's seriousness, which stares out of archaic images and is masked in traditional art by their familiar language until strengthened to the point of total alienation. Oh my god. Quite a difficult day, quite a difficult session of reading, but at the same time, some very interesting stuff. I did get quite a bit out of this discussion of enigmaticalness. Anyway, that's it. I'll see you in the morning.